So, guys, I grew up with a normal childhood like everybody. Right. Okay. Yeah, I got up every morning and make sand castles with my grandma. All right. Yeah. And then one day my grandpa came in and took away the urn. Oh, <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. Did he take the shovel too? Oh, man. Oh, hey, man. Welcome to the Big Bad Broadcast, dude. Good afternoon and welcome to the Big Bad Broadcast, where you can find us anywhere the podcast. You get your podcast. And we got a great show for you today. We have Mike Grief, the dean of the Long Island Clown College. Hey, it's yeah. great to be here. Today's going to be a lot of fun, man. I'm looking forward to it. And we have Craig Mitchell. Now, if Mike is the dean, I'm going to be the Jan. So we're the Jan and no. Dean. No, the you're the you're the janitor. The janitor. <laughs> oh, that, thank you. Uh, I hope we I have a great guest for you today, and his credits go on and on. Three times Pro Bowl, two times All Pro. Out of 568 extra points, he made 562. Yes. Field goals, 80%. Wow. 1,711 points in his career. Not only that, he was in the Kansas City Hall of Fame, and he played for the Patriots one year, which we won't bring up. He paid for <laughs> Kansas City, oh, and real. his whole career was really Kansas City. Um, I think it was 12 years. And then he played for the New York Jets. And I met J-A-T-S, him in 1992, J-A-T-S, J-A-T-S. and I will tell that story, which is kind of funny. And he's a good guy, and he's got lots to talk about. So let's bring to you Nick Lowry. Woo! Yeah. yeah. All hey, right. Hey, let's get it straight. Five five to seven pro uh, all-time all pros. Most accurate kicker in NFL history when I retired. Most 50-yard field goals when I retired. Longest field goal in the history of the NFL still in the first quarter. Uh, best PAT percentage ever from 20 yards. Um, but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> I just took all that off your Wikipedia page. So yeah. that needs some updating. <laughs> and, and you played with, I mean, not only were you, you know, I mean, you were a, a, a kicking legend, but you played with legends like Marty Schottenheimer and uh, uh, Pete uh, P. Carroll, uh, Joe Montana, and Rich Kotite. I might have gone over stuff. <laughs> Rich Kotite, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to do let, that. Let, let's replace Rich Kotite, God bless him, with Marcus Allen and Derek Thomas. Oh, hell yes. Oh, yeah. Hell yes. yes. All right, so I just have to tell my personal story how I got to meet him. I was working on the SS Norway, I think it was 92, because that was this. You went to the Jets in 92, right? No, so this May- is 94. I was with the Jets. Okay, so it was 93. It was the summer of 93, I believe. So we were on the we the SS Norway was the official cruise line of the NFL. So they'd have a football player once a week. The Norway, so John. I, I think what? I was one of the, the Norway. On that. Yeah, the SS Norway. Norway. Oh, it's, Norway a thing, it's, a, it's a good thing you weren't on the Norway. You would have missed port to the left. But anyway, go ahead. So anyway, I was on the stage and I pulled up Nick's girlfriend on stage and kind of tortured her a bit. And then next day I went back to this kicking demonstration which we were up on the like three decks to the back of the ship. And he goes, I'm going to kick some footballs. Now, granted, I mean, he's an amazing kicker, but the ship's moving about 15 miles an hour. There's a wind and we're moving forward and he's kicking these balls to the point where you can't even see them <laughs> off the back <laughs> of the ship. And the environmental agent came up and said, officer and said, you can't be kicking that stuff into the ocean. And Nick took out a pen and signed the ball and went, now it's a souvenir, <laughs> kicked another one. <laughs> and then said to me, hey, funny man, I want you to hold the ball while I kick it. And I was never so afraid in my life. And I remember saying to him, I don't, oh. want, you to, I don't want you to kick me in the hand. And he looked at me and said, I'm the most accurate kicker in the NFL. You think I'm going to kick you in the hand? Good and hand. Said to kick you in the nuts. He goes, whatever you do, just don't move the ball when I go to kick it, or that could be pretty deadly to my career. And and I held the ball, and his leg went by my my his leg went by my ear like a, a like a bullet. <laughs> and that, yeah, it was pretty amazing. And then he got drafted to the Jets, and we stayed in touch. And this I wasn't was the drafted. High- That's another story. But this is the. I mean, he was traded to the Jets. But I this is the highlight of my son's life, Nick. You invited us to the Jets practice at Hofstra. And he was four years old. Oh. And 
you invited us and it was a really hot day and you kept running up in the stands and give him glasses of Gatorade. Oh. And basically he kept those cups until he was like 12 years old. Oh, that's And then so cool. yeah, then you invited him down on the well, field. I wasn't throw- that much of a dick. What a what a thing <laughs> to know. <laughs> then you invited him down to the field to throw the football around and this is also what he remembers. Jumbo Elliott at the time was on the team came up and picked him up. He put his thumb under one armpit and his middle finger under the other one, picked him up with one hand and balanced him on his bicep and went, how you doing, little man? <laughs> my son was, like, terrorized. <laughs> oh, my God. I just and... tell people that John held my balls. and, and yeah. it, <laughs> it, wow. it, So we do have so, stuff in common. You're lucky he didn't make him disappear. <laughs> it's like when you go to see the proctologist you just you just feel closer to him afterwards it's just there's a connection <laughs> meanwhile my new proctologist is some like not proctologist my urologist is this hot 25 year old girl five-year-old girl 25 year old girl, 25 year old girl. i'm thinking woman 25 year old woman okay. and i said to her i go you know i come from a medical background so i don't feel uncomfortable talking to you I go, but there must be some guys that are pretty intimidated because you're really pretty. And she goes, and she starts laughing. She goes, I had a couple that came in here. And as soon as I walked in the room, the guy went, "Uh uh-oh, I'm not, I I can't see you. And the wife grabbed him by the collar and slammed him down in the chair and said, hey, I've been seeing a guy for 25 years. You'll you'll see her. (laughs) So, yeah. John says so. you got a medical. I got a medical background too, John. I was a drug addict. So anyway, uh, but <laughs> and I was a hypochondriac. So we all have medical background. There you go, there Nick. You go. Man, I'm looking at that. The L uh, was that the 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 brandy the the, the what is the shirt? There you go, El Bandito. El Bandito. We were featured as the third best celebrity tequila, but frankly, we are about as good as it gets. I mean, and truly, it was started by a former teammate. Jim Bob Morris, who was with us briefly with the Chiefs and then fin- finished his career after a couple of years in the USFL. He finished with the Green Bay Packers, made a lot of money in real estate, uh, building skyscrapers in in uh, Chicago. Then he started an ingredients company, then a packaging company, which still exists, one of the better ones in the country, Morris Packaging. And, and he's staying up late at night. This is where the George Clooney thing, we were talking before the show about George Clooney. And they're drinking Casamigos and it's 2 a.m., you know, and they've had a lot and they're relaxing. And Chris Chilios is a hockey hall of famer. And I know. Oh, yeah. And and Chris looks at Jim Bob, he goes, What do you think? And Jim Bob goes, I think it sucks. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and and so Chris goes, Well, we should do our own. And Jim Bob goes, done. So that night he drew the bandito, which is which is inspired from that last scene in Butch Cassidy and, and the Sundance Kid, where um Robert Redford and Paul Newman are behind a rock. They've been chased by the posse. The Bolivian army right. has caught up with them, and the colonel, about a hundred yards away, goes, El bandito Yankee, yeah. Ya! <laughs> and just that scene there. And by the way, at the end of that movie. They freeze frame it when they're running out, and you're assuming because you hear all the guns that they're going to be killed, but you never know. So there yeah. could be a sequel. But anyway, um, they started it and they did it right. And it's got blue Weber agave, no additives. What's happened with Casamigos? God bless it. It was a it was a very good or decent decent um, tequila. But when George Clooney sold it, the wonderful people put in the usual additives, glycerin and vanilla and whatever. And it's just not very good. And um, ours is amazing. There's no bite. Uh, it's been fun. I, I'm really not a big drinker, but it, it's been fun uh, sharing it with people because, you know, they're not used to having something that just kind of warms you up. Yeah. And I used uh, to love tequila. Right. One suggestion, man, can you put fluoride in it? Because, man, it's usually the breakfast of champions, you know, just put a little fluoride. <laughs> okay. You can make it a healthier thing. Whatever you, you know. want. Whatever you want. <laughs> uh, it's won the Tag Award, which is double blind tasting. Those are the only, you know, they give out a million awards. You want an award? Yeah, well, you paid our company two million bucks to to help us win. But no, Tag is is double blind tasting. The Proof Awards won those two. So we won the Platinum Awards, the Gold Awards. Uh, it's a hundred dollar tequila that's selling in, in um, 
liquor stores for about 40 bucks and it is really really good really smooth oxygenated from jalisco and it's kind of cool thing for the ladies it's the best senior female dis, uh, distiller senora rojo she's kind of a, a legend so i've enjoyed it a lot uh jim bob actually married my first serious girlfriend in the nfl way way back and we both uh, broke up with her after about two years. And now we, we look at each other and we go, yep, drop dead gorgeous, bat shit crazy. And we yeah. high five each other. <laughs> See, well, I, was, I was a street drinker, so I had just one little question. I mean, does it go with Boone's Farms? You know, Boone's Farm is such an extraordinary standard that we wanted to stand alone. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you, that it sounds so good that if I ever start drinking again, I'll start with that. I have a I will just to go back to football. I have one question, right? So obviously, when you were in high school, you you played. I got, in, I got my props. There you go. Yeah, you yeah. worked at you went you went to high school in Washington, right? In Washington D.C., St. Albans right. School. And then, so you were probably a star there, right? And then you went to college, right? Yeah, the man's college. humble. He's humble. And no, no, I'm just saying. So you went to college. This, this is something I always wonder about. So you go to college. And now your dream is to be in the NFL, right? Yeah, you know, and and really, I was so spoiled. I mean, think about it. My next door neighbor, John and, and Mike and Craig, when I was six, we moved into 6803 Hampshire Road in, in McLean, Virginia. And in 6801, next door was Justice Byron White just moving in, who had just been sworn in as a Supreme Court Justice, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, had I've uh, been in charge of the U.S. Marshals for Bobby Kennedy in the Department of Justice back when the Department of Justice actually was the Department of Justice, just saying. And, uh, oh, my gosh, the algorithms, they're going to they're gonna cut us off. Anyway. Uh, you didn't say we, guy, you're all right. <laughs> this guy, Justice White, um, led the NFL in rushing twice. First for the Pittsburgh Steelers, got the biggest bonus in, in history. He was a superstar with the University of Colorado, Rhodes Scholar, Ooh. and went to England studying at Oxford, and that's how he met the Kennedy family, because Joseph Kennedy, their father, was the ambassador to England from the United States, and what so he it? met Bobby, met John, he met uh, Joe Kennedy Jr. Was it Wizard White? Wizard White. Oh, and, you know. and so right. what's really cool is that having that kind of person next door to you, you know, it just makes you think what is possible in the world. And it's not that I really thought it was possible at uh, that deeper level, but I did it did enter my my head that maybe, you know, when I kicked a 32-yard field goal against Landon when I was, you know, in ninth grade and then a 43-yarder to beat Sidwell where Obama's kids went. Right. Uh, and Clinton's, uh, Chelsea Clinton went. Uh, we beat them 3-0. Those, you know, those little things. And then the last second field goal, the last two seconds of my career in high school and against Landon to beat them, literally the last two seconds. And, uh, you know, each one of those makes you think, well, maybe, well, maybe. Um, but what I'm most proud of is, um, you know, despite having a pretty good year uh, career at Dartmouth, I got my ass handed to me 11 times, rejected 11 times, 11 tryouts, 11, uh, you know, chances to make it and told I wasn't good enough. And for those people that whether you're comedians, <laughs> whether you're <laughs> actors, whether you're singers, where, whatever you're doing, man, you just got to hang in there and believe in yourself and believe in the process of getting better. And what I had to do was be confident in front of 80,000 people and 11 very large, angry people paid lots of money to block my kick and, and if possible, eat my forearm and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and get used to that different standard. It's not high school anymore. It's not you're just a star and if you miss a big deal. It's not college and give it the old college and, try. And everything, right? Don't they say everything moves like 10 times faster than you used Much to, Much right? faster and, and having to deal with, you know, if you miss it, learn and then flush it down your mental toilet if you will and move on for the next one so uh but i'm really proud of just not giving up and i just have a funny feeling you guys have your stories of you know we i mean i know. heard uh dave Chappelle talking about how much he sucked when he started uh and look look at where he is now one of the one well, of i remember the dave dave when he started i remember he couldn't get yeah. into he was too young they would they would let him come in he would do his set and he'd have to right. leave because he was too young to be in the club be on the bar yeah. <laughs> yeah and look at him now you know gosh he's so refreshing he's got the balls speaking of uh balls uh to uh <laughs> 
to take on this stuff and just say, listen, man, have a sense of humor. We've got to laugh at ourselves. And so anyway, thanks for uh, talking about that. And just being a kicker in the NFL, man, it's, it's just every man's story of being the individual trying to be part of the team and, and making huge mistakes with everybody humiliates you. And then finally saying, Fuck you. You I'm had a great it. I saw I'm a you make it. I saw a YouTube clip right with playing uh Philadelphia, right? Where you scored all in only points, right? Twelve points. Uh well, field goals. I mean, was well, Chicago field goals. was I mean, five the, the, goals, the thing uh, says the thing says on it, Nick Lowry beats uh I think it was Philadelphia single handed. I think it was Chicago and then and then actually one of the my, my favorite memories when Joe Montana came in, it was like it was having a rock star. I mean, yeah. it was incredible. And he had been held back, you know, with the whole Steve Young competition and controversy. So he was ready to show what he really could show. And we're playing on uh, Monday night, our first big Monday night game with him in Arrowhead Stadium, packed. I mean, everybody, the eyes of the world there again, him against John Elway. Huey Lewis is standing next to my kicking net. And I run out and kick a 38-yard field goal, run out and kick a 41-yard field goal, run out and kick a 45-yard field goal, run out and kick a 52-yard field goal. And the fourth time I come back, he goes, man, this is easy for you. I'm like, hey, we're having fun, baby. And we <laughs> we uh, we were beating That's them. The power we of them, Nick. We beat them 15 to 7. We were, we were shutting them out until about the last 30 seconds. But the next day, USA Today had a – a title that said a headline that said kicker upstages Montana. Oh. So I took, I took the, the, the magazine cause his locker was about four over and said, Hey Joe, what do you think buddy? And he's like, fuck you. Fuck you. I have, wait, I have a, Nick, I, 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 a, there's a question. Way. There's a question. I always, I, I used a sportscaster back in the nineties. And, and there's a question I always wanted to ask. And it's something I've always felt that at all the positions uh, on a football uh, team, the kicker is the least respected in a lot of ways because, uh, especially today, they, they almost treat them like they're disposable. You're great for a week, and then the next week you're on the verge of being cut. Do, do you feel that that's unfair? Did I feel it was unfair? Yeah, I mean, you, I mean it's I'm so precarious. It it's, it's just the way it is. What are you, you going to do? You want to hear... This I want it. you to be. I'm so sensitive. Don't cut me. It's going to hurt my feelings. I mean, what happens is, you're only as good as your last game, right? Yeah. What happens is you just say, you know what? I screwed up. How do I get better? I, I remember getting cut by the Patriots. Uh, I played two games with them. We won both games. I had only one attempt from 45 yards, and I was scared. Another technical term, since we are not rated, shitless. <laughs> and shitless. <laughs> I knew I had to get stronger emotionally so the next year i'm trying out with cincinnati then the redskins i'm kicking field goals i'm out kicking all the guys that i wasn't quite clearly out kicking the year before and you know just i think when you baptize yourself with all those rejections after a while you you're like i've paid my damn dues i'm ready and and then it never stops you have to always be working to get better but i feel blessed that you know just realizing that I can use those rejections to get better. Here's the question. Have, How do you steal way. yourself? Like you said, you're in front of 80,000 people and the focus is on you. I think it's even more than the quarterback. The focus is on the kid. Yeah, you're the only one out there. And, and you're the only, you're the only one. And it's 80,000. Yeah. How, how do you like separate yourself from the reality that's around you? Because yeah. I mean, it must be like you said, terrifying. I mean, what kind of, like, how do you put yourself in that zone to just to do that job? You know what? I, I, I love being on this show with three uh professional comedians because you know that place on the stage people can throw shit at you they can you know yell you hurt you know uh, you know you're racist or whatever they're going to say and and really the the similarity i came to see that that spot between where the ball was going to be placed my holders getting down eight yards behind the line of scrimmage i back up four yards three steps back two over that if i if i drew a uh rectangle that's my office and i don't freaking let anybody in that office mm. i don't let them mess with this i'm totally focused on if i can control that space then good things are going to happen and the more i got to that place of simplifying it because the referee going to be the wind's going to be the way it is 
the guys at Raider Stadium or in or in New England or in New York are, you know, they're very sweet, they're very loving. They really want you to, you know, feel good willing to look past anything that goes about wrong. Self esteem, you know, <laughs> you know, and they want to give you a trophy even if you miss. But just in case, you say, forget all that. This is what I'm going to control. That's my office. And I see that maybe at some level. When you're on the stage, I'm projecting that you guys are like, man, this is my, I own this shit. This is yeah. my place. Yeah. Right. And, and if there's a heckler, you get to that place where, you know, you just made the worst mistake of your yeah, life. Not yeah. in my house, exactly. brother. Not now in my you're house. the target. That is a, that was an awesome description. Thank you. It really that, is. That was really a freaking yeah. awesome description. Now, have you, have you, have you, you know, obviously I, I'm betting that you've taken that philosophy and use it now in the, in, in the projects you're doing, I bet. Yeah, you know, I look at that as the analogy for our lives, right? That we have to um, own where we are. We have to own our mindset, own how we, the discipline we have every day. I mean, my life is so different now, but I had a, a moment and we'll, I'm sure we'll go into it. John said, we're going to cover a lot of stuff and, you know, I get to do some really cool things. And so those are what I look at as life being part of a tree, you know, and if we have the, the ability to keep taking risks, each each risk is a slightly higher branch where we see more opportunities and it's just allowing ourselves to keep growing you know as good as you guys were as good as dave Chappelle was when he was 15 going into those you know first uh comedy places clubs uh i mean he's just supremely confident i mean he had the confidence to leave that show when he was offered what was it i don't know yeah millions and millions of dollars a lot of money he knew it was not authentic to him. And so it's an overused word, but uh, Oprah uses the word uh, authentic a lot, but it is true. You know, the more clear we are with who the hell we are and that defining that as our values, you know, how we treat people. But also if you get to that place where you use your success, that stage, which is what a kicker's stage is, man, it's right there to help others too, right? Help others deal with their demons and also make a contribution, man. That's a beautiful thing. And that's that I had this moment about two months ago, man, where I thought, I really feel like my life now is just as good or better than anything I did in, in the NFL. And I'm, I'm blessed. The NFL is the best run business probably anywhere. Uh, it, it's, it's four to five times more popular than baseball and the NBA and uh, you know, hockey. Uh, I'm blessed that I was able to be part of that. It's a really serious business now with, with huge salaries. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know what? I was the highest paid, thanks to Lee Steinberg and um, Art Kaminsky. I was the highest paid kicker in the history of the NFL for 10 years. And um, But more, it's what it teaches you, man. It's what it teaches you. You know, what are the eternal, what are the, the key lessons that you can take with you so that, you know, at the end of your life, you can help. You can be the mentor to help a young comedian. You not give up and, you know, maybe yeah. become the star. I always look at it as a success. I started out to be a comedian, I, a paid professional comedian. I accomplished that, paid to be an actor, you know. And so it's like, it doesn't matter the level of the success. It's like, because you see, you know, a lot of people want to judge against others. And I don't look at it that way. I look at my own success. I accomplished what I set out to do. That makes me a success, at least to me. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So you know, listen, I, I, I'll give you a compliment here, uh, uh, Nick, because I'm big into fantasy football. And every year, by the time it came my choice, I could never get you on my team. But I always had John Carney for some reason. But uh, I tried. Good. I tried. Yeah, he is good. But I want, you know, I want it. I want the best. Okay? You want the best. I want the best. It's like. I want Camus. I want, uh, you know, Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. I want the good stuff. Listen to this. <laughs> this is this is you want the best. My uncle was a huge football player in high school in Flushing, Queens. He won the All-American. He was everything. He got drafted first round to Syracuse University. He was wow. a running back. Got to Syracuse University, and they said, yeah, there's only one guy trying out for that position. His name is Jim Brown. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my, Jim Brown was yeah, Syracuse. I didn't know that. Yeah. So my uncle what, had to play against. So he said in those days, when two guys were trying out for a position, you you know you went against that guy, like in all drills and stuff, to see oh, who was going to be the tough guy. Oh shit! And he said, as time went on, he realized that he had been the star football player his entire life, and that Jim Brown was going to actually take that away from him. 
So he said there was one day in practice where he hit Jim, he hit Jim Brown so hard. He goes, I thought I killed them. He goes, I thought I killed them. And, you know, he goes, it wasn't a cheap shot. It was a clean hit, but I took everything I had out on him and I hit him. <laughs> so they went, he went to the 50 year reunion for the Syracuse for them winning the thing. Yeah, and so they're all hanging out and Jim Brown's sitting by himself and he's got a big group of people around him. So the group kind of dissipates. And my uncle's name was Frank Mambuca. He goes, Hey, Buca, were you too good to come say hello? And he goes, no, no, I'm just waiting for the crowd to disappear. So he walked over and then the whole team kind of surrounded him. And he looks at the guys and he goes, you see this guy, this guy hit me harder than I was ever hit in my life. Wow. wow. It That's made my cool. uncle's life. <laughs> That is so awesome. I interviewed Jim Brown when the Super Bowl was here about eight years ago. And, uh, you know, there's another, you know, I just think the mentoring figure, the elder, if we can hold on to that, that's what's going to help us get back to a healthier America, you know, and Jim Brown had become this deeply wise guy, you know, he'd been, he'd been advising gangs and prisoners and, uh, you know, didn't, didn't really have any limits to who he, who he could help. And, you know, this is a guy who was about as violently effective and powerful, maybe, you know, certainly in the top 10, if not the best football player of all time, the most yeah, dominant quit when he was 29, I think. Yeah, no no argument with that, man. And, um, and just such a d divine, calm, thoughtful human being. And uh, I've been lucky to do work back then when I met you, I was just starting Native Vision, which is a program for Native youth. I've done work with inner city youth, which became known as Youth Friends. And uh, Native Vision was on Oprah as the best new program for Native kids. These kids, they're the same. I, I go to um, Lansing Prison once a year with this 90-year-old Jewish grandmother, Sue Ellen Freed. And these are murderers, man. And we, we have a Christmas event. Uh, 40 guys in a circle and uh, we just talk about, you know, life and uh, they're really cool people because they force themselves to talk about, you know, what is respect? How do I deal with these tough emotions? And, you know, and then now I work with the homeless called champions for the homeless, but all these things, man, I love doing because it, it, it destroys all of that Hollywood uh, image you know, that success is a pedestal. No success should break through all of the bullshit and give you access, if you can, to everybody and say, you've got power too, man. You know, whether you're a little kid, whether you're an abused person from a bullied person, whether you mm -hmm. are poor, whether you're, and frankly, a lot of very mm -hmm. unhappy people that are wealthy. I see a lot of them here in Scottsdale and Paradise Valley. And so that's where the blessing is, man. When you know the juice is there, you got a chance to be happy because, you know, God puts you through. I'm going to use that word, God. Oh, God, nobody run, okay? God puts you through <laughs> uh, trials, but they also help you understand what really lasts, what really matters, man. So that's why I love my life. Yeah, I could have used a mentor like you. Like I said, I grew up in the, uh, the the housing projects in New York. And it was the same thing. Like, you know, it's, 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 it's when I decided to become a comedian. Trust me, it's like, it's such an odd choice. And it's such a weird, you know, it's like my father it's thought I was just trying to avoid too, real... Yeah. But I had to come to the place where I could actually believe that I had some kind of self-worth because you believe what you grow up with. You grow up in that, like you're talking about prisoners and everything. Yeah. And a lot of them grow up in places where they believe they're not going to live long. They're pieces of shit, yep. you know, the, uh, because it, and it's like, so that's their mindset. And that's why they go into half the stuff they go into. But if they caught them at a young age, maybe and mentor them and show them they have self-worth. They have yeah. all kinds of, you know, oh the, the love of God. And one all... powerful reference sometimes. I mean, I'll tell you, uh, Mike, um, about four years, no, nah, what was it? It was just before COVID. So the Chiefs had the one-on-one banquet, and which is one of the best NFL awards banquets, one of the top two. And the day after, it's at the Western Crown Center in, in downtown Kansas City. And I'm having uh, brunch, Sunday brunch, the day after the award ceremony with some with a friend and there's a guy in a sweatshirt african-american guy in a sweatshirt and he, he keeps glancing over he's about 25 feet away at another table and as soon as my friend leaves he comes over and said hey can i join you for a moment i said sure he said back in 1989 you and kevin ross kevin ross is in the Chiefs hall of fame he's uh, i think he's now a coach with tampa bay uh, he was a, one of the coaches when tampa bay beat my chiefs a few years ago um and this guy said, 
when you and Kevin Ross were talking to me in my football team, he said, and I, in that moment, I said, I want to be like him. I want to do something like him. I want to do it, something that makes a difference. He said, my mother was in prison. My dad, I didn't know where he was. He said, when I was like 21, I was able to buy because I set my sights on it. I, I bought a house because I knew my mother needed a place to live when she got out of prison. He said, today, I own all the houses on that block. And that's all for people coming out of prison. Wow. And wow. I just think, man. Yeah. What a gift to give me, you know, that reference that just planting that seed with that kid was all he needed in the midst of having no parents, man. And yeah. yet how many would not only not have parents, but, but remember their mom and have compassion for their mom to give her a home. And then, you know, what that fed in him and maybe the synergy with her seeing how she suddenly felt like, God, somebody really cared. My own son cares despite all the guilt and, you know, probably the shame and, and look what he's done with his life. So man, that is, that's such positive, powerful energy. I'd, I'd and, love to see celebrities give back to kids because it's, that's the thing is, is you see a kid and it does affect, it's important for a kid to know that you're real. Cause I'm telling you, when you grow up poor and you grow up with, with a lot of crime and a lot of abuse, you know, you don't understand that those people you see on TV, that you, they're real, you know, it's almost like they're not real. It's a fantasy. But when we meet people like you, it's, it, it touches, it really does have an effect. Well, thank you. You know, and, and by the way, like me means like shitty old Nick. I mean, Nick the dick, you know, I mean, in Nick other words, the kick. yeah, hopefully Nick, Nick the, kick, the kick, but you know what I'm saying is, <laughs> is we have had moments when we have not done the right thing and we learned and we began to just tap into like sculpting, getting the wrong pieces away. So we get to the good stuff, man. We are, we're this internal sculpture and we've got to get that other stuff out, but That's it is so true. I've, done, I've been maybe 80 high schools and elementary schools and bullying. It is so true that the ones that bully were the ones that were bullied. It's not yeah. an excuse, but you see the pattern. So uh, here's another stat for you. Um, you know, it's gone almost to the point where there's so many fatherless families Kids that have a stable father at home, whether there's a mother there or not, that is the 100% determinant of them going to prison or not. Wow. 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 Having a stable father. So anybody that's saying, you know, mothers, mothers are incredibly important, but having a stable father for a male figure and probably female too, but still is unbelievably important. So, you know, that's so being the mentor, man, I've been lucky. I've been had, had the wizard whites of the world. And, uh, and by the way, uh, John, I'm not, I think I may have told you this, but then in 2005, I was living in paradise Valley, just a couple of miles over here. And my friend Phyllis Wallace, who ran our adult role models for youth program, which became known as, youth friends, inner city program, 20,000 kids, 3,000 volunteers. And I'd stayed in touch with them. She said, our friend, Cle uh, Cleve Walker, is best friends with Muhammad Ali. Oh. And Muhammad Ali had moved in uh, about two months earlier. And she said, Cleve is going to come over. And I'm like, yeah, well, of course, you think with your friends, there's a lot of exaggeration. Right, right. Two days later, he knocks on the front door and I open the door and there's Muhammad Ali in the drive in the passenger seat of their white um, Range Rover. And Cleve goes, Hey, um, I'm with Muhammad. I'm Cleve Walker. Uh, come on over. If you want to have tea with us or coffee, Muhammad loves cookies. <laughs> and so that started this relationship with the most famous person on the planet, on the planet. Yep. Uh, for the next, mm, what was it? 13 years and I would take him to movie premieres. I took him, I drove him to the NBA all-star game. I'm driving down to, this is when it was like, I don't know, 2008, I think I'm driving down to downtown Phoenix going, don't crash the car. You'll be hated in the world. <laughs> and uh, I'm following Muhammad Ali it, right up into the in, inside of, of the Suns, Phoenix Suns arena and all this security, and then we walk right through. I'm right behind him with Marilyn, his sister-in-law, 
uh, his wife, Lonnie's sister. And we go into the locker room. There's LeBron James and uh, Dwayne Wade and Yao Ming and Alan <laughs> Iverson. And they're all like little kids with him. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I, I came to see this man, you know, at the end of his life with Parkinson's, with still with an incredible sense of humor and uh, a, just his number one value. Here's a guy that was, I think the greatest fighter in his prime, absolutely of all time. Right. But also, he put boxing great, back on the map. The the man that that defined what athletes can do with that spotlight and to stand up against the Vietnam War and and and, and have the courage to stay strong during that and be vindicated. And we all know the nineteen ninety six Olympics where he's holding yeah yeah the uh, yeah. you know the Olympic so, torch. Um, to, for me to have that guy and to see his number one value as a Muslim, but number one as a human being was love. Right. right. Love. And God, I wish, I wish we could have had him healthy for another 15, 20 right. years. And I think this will uh, be Nick, people, so people, always, pe spoiled. people always got to be, what is like your quintessential moment in this business? So years ago, I was working at Caroline's and Don King was in the front row. So I called him up on stage and I'm going, so does the word hairbrush mean anything to you? <laughs> Stuff like that. So after he invites me to his fight in Orla in uh, Atlanta. So I go to the fight with this guy who owns Caroline's on their private jet. We fly there. We get to the hotel. We meet Don King. We go to the Omni in a motorcycle escort. He's in one limo. We're in the other. So we go there and I walk in and he puts his arm around my neck and my friend Neil was like pretty hammered and he's a little skinny guy with glasses and he's going, the magic's in the air because the magic man has come to town and my friend Neil and Neil's going, I could have been a contender, I could have been somebody. Right. I could have been somebody. <laughs> so been somebody. we go and after the fight we go <laughs> to this party and I'm at the party and this beautiful black woman comes up to me. And I'm looking at her thinking, I know who this is, but I don't know who this is, but she's so familiar. And she says, somebody tells me you're a magician. And I go, yeah. And she goes, my dad loves magic. She, yeah. goes, come on. she goes, come on over. I want you to meet my dad. And it was Muhammad Ali. Yep. And he, yeah. and he showed me some tricks. And it was like the highlight of my life. Oh, you my know? God. Mm -hmm. I brought a, a, comedian, a comedian, a magician named Gene Urban over to Muhammad's house just for that reason. And I, I, I gotta, I'll send you pictures. Um, anybody that wants to go to my Facebook page is Nick Lowry, L O W E R Y Nick, the kick. But if you go to albums and scroll down, uh, right near the bottom is a bunch of ones with Mohammed and, and some of them with him doing, uh, at the Kona grill at fashion square here doing these tricks with me. And he's got, he's got a mouse on my arm and he's, but he becomes the old Muhammad Ali. He becomes the, the showman. And yeah, when he was doing the magic, spot, he was doing magic tricks for me, and he's going. Yeah. He goes, you take the handkerchief, you put it in your hand like this. You put it in your hand. You think it's in the hand? No, it's not in the hand. Look, look, it's in my pocket. It's in my pocket. You didn't know where it was, did you? you know? It's like, it was so cool. It was so cool. And and, so cool, and Nick, you're, you're also doing, you said champions for the homeless, right? Is that is that just local to where you are, or is that nationwide? Or? Well, I'd love for it to become nationwide. We've done it for 17 years. It's at St. Vincent de Paul. And I will say, anybody that's starting something, make sure you start with a stable group of leadership. And these guys are just deeply, their core values are there. So we have hung in there through thick and thin. We were up to 500 volunteers serving 1,000 homeless and when you got 500 people, almost they're all over the place looking at you in the eye with respect and love and saying, how are you doing? What's your story? And then COVID came and mm. the health health commission told us we had to cut down to 15 plus oh. our van. We got this awesome van. So we went outside for a couple of years and we kept serving, man. And we made Phoenix the first city in the country to provide free COVID testing for the homeless. Um, and I'll never forget the looks on the faces of our, our friends because, um, you know, probably two thirds of them were the same and, and it does change. There is turnover, but they're like, what are you doing here? You're, you're yeah. here. It's COVID. Yeah. And we're like, why would we not be here when it matters the most? Man, right. this is, and so uh, Champions it, it, for the Homeless has put a human face on the homeless. What we do is the media here. By contrast with the, I will affectionately refer to the knuckleheads in LA and San, San Francisco, in the media, 
and the politicians that throw all the homeless into one big bucket and just talk about them as the homeless as opposed to individuals with their own stories. And yeah, high percentage have some substance issues and some mental health issues. But you think you and I wouldn't have some mental health issues if right. we were <laughs> on the street for a year? You think exactly. we might have a few? Just I got to tell you, that, that's the reason why I brought it up, because I, I get teased about this. But one of the ways I make ends meet is by driving ride share on the weekends. Right. And I drive 400 miles a night and all, wow. through, all through Los Angeles. And there are times, especially when I go downtown uh, near Skid Row, where I feel like I'm in some kind of dis- dis- the, the, some movie that just couldn't be real yeah with just just literally blocks and blocks of shanties of and, hopelessness and, and it's it just it's it rips the heart out of me and i i mean as compassionate as i am about it i i'm just like what can i do on one guy and to see somebody like you who's actually addressing it i mean even doing it on a local level is a major major undertaking and I just wish and you talk about Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, I agree with you on that assessment. Well, one of the reasons you don't get as much compassion is because people fear what they don't understand. And like Nick was saying, yep. these are individuals. Yeah, there's yep. mental issues, there's drug issues. But why? You know, you got to dig deeper. You can't lump them all into one package and go, they're criminal. People want to just say they're criminals, they're dirty. Oh, they, they do. Just- and but that's, on, the next, on, the next, on the next door app, they go, oh, there's a homeless guy. But you'll never solve the problem this. like that. You'll never yeah. solve the problem. You've got to yeah. take yeah. on an People, individual. You know, yeah. Mike and Craig and John, if there's a sanctuary, so imagine going back to the family, what we come out of, we talked about that and how that affected you growing up in the public housing and not having people say, you know, you do matter. Imagine hey, we're still kids. I don't care how old we get. We still got that piece of us that likes encouragement and stability and if you have for somebody that's part of that community in Los Angeles, if there was within one mile, within walking distance, a sanctuary where they know they can go and people will look them in the eye and they'll be fed. They'll get to take a shower once, twice a week. Uh, we give away haircuts. We give away a thousand flowers just because it doesn't have oh, to have a damn reason right. because you yeah. va- you you matter. Right. We, of course, they have great food. My buddy, uh, Todd Stottlemyre, who's, Father was a oh, great Todd. for the Yankees. Todd won three World Series rings. He owns Koi Vito Poke with his wife Erica. They provide the food. Uh, we have haircutters. We gave away sixty haircuts this time. We're going to try to get up to about a hundred. Uh, where were you guys? That. Where were you guys centered? Where is, is it, this? Is, is at St. Vincent de Paul, Tenth Avenue, and Jackson, downtown Phoenix. Phoenix. And uh, and then we give away. We have my NFL brothers come. I've had you know some pretty famous players, Larry Fitzgerald, the owners of the of the Arizona Cardinals, um, Wimbledon champions. Uh, we, you know, just all sorts of different people. Great musicians. Our band's awesome, and um, we just love them. We give away a thousand T-shirts, a thousand pairs of underwear, a thousand pairs of socks, uh, backpacks. Uh, hats uh this last time you know it's been we've had 52 days over 110 degrees the, yeah. the average is 21 this year has been crazy um but you know having skin products right it just makes a huge difference so uh and and then of course donated clothing as well so all those things you, uh, my idea is overwhelm them mm-hmm. with a sense there's so many things we're here for you and if it just reminds them that little bit of ray of hope of light somebody gives a in shit. the tunnel yeah. somebody gives a shit and say Vince de paul does it every day you know so they provide the stability then i can plug in all these different things so we always add a little bit we give away uh a thousand five dollar gift cards to mcdonald's and starbucks and just little treats you know um and i'll sign my posters you know these posters you guys ever want to do something maybe we can do something in la sometime but i give these oh, yeah. away get some of my nfl buddies to come and and oh, and nice. that's that's champions for the homeless right there. Very cool. Well, um, I, I know I know I know a bunch of uh, Phoenix comics. So if you ever want to do a show to raise money or something like that, let me know and I can definitely hook you up with that. I, yeah. I know a few of those guys at the Tempe Improv. They're kind yeah, of you know hey. you know more than I do. I forgot yeah. you nicked the kick. That's why I should have known. <laughs> I'm gonna be in your I'm gonna be in your neck of the woods uh, in October. I'm going to see a buddy of mine. He's in Cave Creek. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, you want to get you, you want to get on Tempe Improv, or you, you need a little agent? I mean, just no, tell me. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I do. I do my stand up here and there, but I haven't done a lot of stand up in in once I started getting more with the acting. And right now, it just it's been you know with the COVID and all that. I haven't it's a lot of roles for, as the tough guy in acting. Can you see why? <laughs> I can see that man, and and the uh, <laughs> sunglasses, of course. That's it. You know, it's no. Actually, it's because I can't stand the light that gets it whatever the the computer thing yeah, where not... are you is is that an actual inside is that a backyard <laughs> <laughs> yeah what what is that, that that's he's in la love, right mike what's that this is in the desert of la craig's yeah. in la i'm in florida yeah this is this is a uh, eagle rock uh, i took a picture from the top of a hill in, in eagle rock there you go. yeah yeah and this is, no, new, this is, this is my studios. backyard <laughs> That's but, but I nice. wanted, but you know what I wanted to ask you, Nick. I mean, it's it's like you said, and and not to say, but I I couldn't help but hear you say before they, you know. Nick the Dick, but and and I know that's because I feel that a, a lot of ways about my past and the things I've done. Is that what got you into working with the homeless and working with a lot of? Is, is be, I know a lot for me. I try to do a lot of whatever I can to help others, and it's to make up. It's it's to make up for not. Being for being who I was when I was younger. You know, I I think I was always a pretty good guy. I was man of the year for the Chiefs four times. I was man of the year in '96 uh, for the Jets. Uh, but there's a difference between man of the year and just you know just the little things, just the little subtle things. And you can always grow and be better at it. I love the book by Eckhart Tolle called The New Earth because for athletes, it basically just says is always a choice between the appetites the hunger of the ego and the spirit. What's, which one are you going to feed? Hmm. And you grow out of, you know, what is a, a positive, healthy developmental function, which is I am going to compare myself and compete. I want to win my trophies. I want to get the best looking girl in school, all those things. And that serves as creating an initial identity, but transcending that initial identity to something bigger that's connected to everybody. Somebody used the word connection, right? In this, and that's where it's all about. And by the way, when you're on stage, like for me, I'm isolating myself. And I got to be connected with the football, and nothing else. Right. But I got to think your empathetic connection with the crowd, the Absolutely. fact that you can pick out people and, and, and connect with them. That's, that's where your greatness is, oh, you know? Yeah. So being able to use that skill and grow with that. So I was not a, a, a dick all the time at all but still people will take you in a moment they don't know and and so you know one of the key things i will say i've never refused an autograph when you take 30 seconds or one minute and even more look them in the eye and say how yeah. you doing what's going on they'll always remember that you cared and right. you recognize them as a human being whether they're homeless or whether they're a nine-year-old kid or an 80-year-old former fan and if you don't, they'll always remember that too. You, so, you, and the weirdest yeah, so thing that about wasn't that... my motivation, Mike, but uh, I just think the motivation is more just, I, I don't feel like I had a tremendous amount of guilt. No, I felt like I treated people pretty well, but you can always get better, grow in more, an overused word, empathy, but grow in just the pat, the capacity to connect to people. You're in right. intuition. That's yeah. part of the mentor's job is the intuition you have. I bet you part of what you would say as an actor, you know, your intuition is pretty powerful in, uh, in how good yeah. you can be. And the, and, and like you said, the empathy, which I think is, a, is, is, is an underrated thing because I think most people, they're thinking about their own pain. They're thinking about their own lack. Even people who are successful, a lot of successful people, all they can see is the things that they don't have, you know, but I think there's, there's a growing movement of people who do look at others instead of looking and go, God, I'm so blessed. Especially in this business, and you, too, you go, yeah, and how you did mean, that guy get this show? I could have got that show. Uh, 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 you know, yeah. shut up. Yeah. But I think, you know? I think yeah. in today's world, just to have enough to eat, to have a roof over your head, to 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 do something that you love and appreciate, I even agree. if it, that is like I feel so blessed, and I want to bless, I want to bless others, you know, as, well, in just, any way that I can. Well, Mike, just, is the, just, Mike, just, Mike is the pussy cat with tattoos. <laughs> well, just to, just to, just to, just to add to what Mike said, and back when I said before, when I'm driving through these streets, you know, and I come here to a modest 750 square foot apartment, you know, it doesn't have the newest furniture and the newest stuff. I feel so damn blessed that I'm that I actually have a roof over my head. I have, I have air conditioning. It's not much, but you know what? In this world, it's everything, and. 
there's people who would absolutely trade places with me in in, oh. in, in less than a heartbeat. And it's carjack, it's, it's carjack your Uber. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't jinx me. <laughs> don't jinx me. Okay. <laughs> Fluff up the aura. Fluff up the aura. <laughs> how about in New York? How about in New York, where in the winter time when I was there? They have, you know, they have these vents that kind of blow out hot air on yeah. the streets, and that's People where the homeless on guys lay. Yeah. So what they did was they put all like spikes on them now, so they can't lay on them. I mean, that's really... I, I think I think their thinking is that we have official programs for people. To, they don't want. I mean, you know, a New York is is all about. Yeah, but you tourism. see a guy like having about... to sleep three feet on the cold concrete. Trust when me, there's somebody hot air justifying... coming out of this vent. It's just wrong. So, somebody you know? justifying everything they do. New York is, you know, it, like I said, it, it's probably because if you have too many people doing that, then the tunnels get extremely hot, and, and then you got equipment problems, and the people are down there start bitching. That's probably... or they don't want homeless people laying around. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, 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 I don't want to be the answer, but that's probably true. Look, know. it's not an easy. There's no easy solution. I mean, homeless. It's been a major problem for uh, for for a long, long it's time. It's getting there's crazy no, now, man. It really is. I think though, and what Nick is to, doing and what he's talking about, it, it's it's you I need to take these so people much. on an individual basis. And it's about education. It's about rehabilitation. You know, it's about transitioning somebody from that and actually making the effort individually to make sure they go from maybe being homeless to learning how to, you know, some education, some work. To, yeah. to slowly stepping up, you know, it, it, right. it, it's... I have a comic friend. His name is Lou Deck. As a matter of fact, he's going to be having surgery on, a, on, on the next couple of days. So he's in my thoughts. But when I first started doing this, he he would make up like 10 or 15 of these bags. And he had toothpaste and socks and aspirin and um, deodorant and shampoo. Right. And what he, he he gave them to me. And when I would see somebody, as you know, I would instead of giving them money and 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 with snack bars, you know, I would hand those out. And they and it was just like I only gave out like ten. And you know, it's it costs money to put you each one together, but it was such a great gesture and it felt so good to do. We need a lot more of that. A lot more of that. I just tell you uh, things I'm we started off talking about, you know, before and 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 today um, I get to do I mean, talk about blessed. I get to I'm representing a company called Alzheimer's Treatment Centers of America. Wow. You know, uh, all of us, I guarantee all of you guys know somebody whose parent or friend. Uh, has I, have dementia. A mem- I have a family member with dementia. My, right dad. Now. my brother, my brother died two years ago, Chris, uh, with complications from Alzheimer's and dementia oh, and sorry. COVID. Sorry wonderful stuff. Um, and then I get to work with something called Massive Blue. We're fighting child trafficking and fentanyl trafficking. And it's using AI to catch the bad guys, the predators um you know and with this wonderful border situation uh, i've made literally one of my best friends now is chris clem who's been all over fox news and some of the other stations that actually cover what's true which is i've been with brian erlacher and uh to the border in yuma uh twice we brought i brought 75 footballs for all the border agents there have been over 21 suicides of border agents nobody talks about that uh, because they went from in Yuma alone, this is direct, 20 when Trump left office, separate from Trump. Look at the realities, guys. Stop making it about one person. There were only 25 people they were capturing a day trying to get across in that 169 mile border from California up to Texas. And uh they went to a thousand, eight hundred, nine hundred, a thousand a day. And I've been inside those border facilities. And they're air conditioned. They have unlimited water, bananas, apples, uh, crushed fruit drinks, um, you know, those little packets, uh, um, protein bars, et cetera. Um, but it's just I'd cross so the border over- for that. It's so it's so <laughs> overwhelming. But now we've got all these other issues. Um, and what's what we right now have is probably two hundred thousand, what I would call functionally sleeper cells of people that were charged by the cartels uh, five to 10,000 bucks a person to take them across and they can't afford it. So when they can't afford it and 90% of them are from 140 different countries, only 10% are from Mexico. This is all documented stuff from Chris Clem, who was the chief of the Southwest border. 
until January, late January, and then mid-January, and then 28 years as a border patrol agent. And so those sleeper cells, basically, it's like that scene in The Godfather where Marlon Brandon goes, you do not owe me anything. However, there will come a time where I will need your assistance yeah. and it will be appreciated. Yeah, now this day and may never come, but... <laughs> it may never come. So then suddenly they're asked to traffic drugs or hold a safe house for, you know, children that are being trafficked or whatever. And the alternative is for them to be killed, a member of their family to be killed, a member of their family to be trafficked. So this is not a dream. This is not a nightmare. It's reality. It's it huge, what's huge going to happen in small, large communities. We know about, of course, 100,000 immigrants in New York City and just the instability, the fact that the lack of responsibility, the cowardice to not just say, this is what we're doing and just say, oh yeah, we've got a secure border. No, man. We've got to, we've got to make it a shittier country. So everyone doesn't want to come here. Yeah. It's, and, it's and fentanyl is, you know, I, I, I'm a recovering opiate addict. I, I stopped in 2014 and got clean. Thank God. If I continued, I mean, this is this, this, a very, I, I was getting my stuff off the street. Uh, I may not be here because of what with the, with the proliferation, proliferation of uh, fentanyl yep. and, and coming from, you know, uh, across the border is, is horrifying. There's a show on HBO Max called Contraband. Yeah. Where they have, uh, like, I guess the four borders in Texas. Yeah. And they show you these people, you know, like, it's unbelievable. Like, like you were saying, like, they had this woman that was bringing a young kid across the border. And they say they're probably possibility that her family is there illegally, but they didn't want to take the kid there. So now that they're there, they're getting mules to bring the kid across. And the kid came across three times in one week with different people and were caught every time. Oh, geez. And, um, you know, and they were saying to the woman, they were asking her all things about the kid and she didn't know anything about it. And then they just brought her in the room. And they said, well, why do you do this? It's $500. Do you need the money that bad? And she said, no, it's about my family. You know, like, in other words, I don't want anything happened to my family you know yep yep Terrible. so it's it's um anyway so i like the idea of catching the traffickers and and at least making sure that uh you know we can anticipate that um because it's it's happening and it's going to happen um and we've got a great country with a lot of fantastic people we're a hell of a lot more united than people want us to think and we have core values that have to do with hard work, caring about your neighbor, contributing, uh, being a good family uh, member. And um, well, I always know, think it's it's a, it's a class America war. It. It's never been it's never been about a race war. These well, all these things they want. It's it's a class war. You know, it's money the, war. It's always the it's a money war. It's the rich against you know the uh, the mega rich who want uh, uh, to keep everyone to keep their attention off of. The, the the manipulation and the thing and that's all the anyway you know I, what this is a comedy show yeah, yeah. I know it's been the comedy yeah, hey, so, speak, but you know <laughs> wait speaking of comedians do you know David Nastor I do David Nastor from uh, Kansas, Kansas City, City. Can I tell my joke so David Nastor and I you know he's in Kansas City and you guys been to Stanford and Sons in Kansas City back in the day yeah I was there once so Carlos Mencia was there one time and whose act was he doing. Mothers, ah, I knew you were going to do that. I knew it. And children, hide your kids now. I'm going to tell the joke. So, Carlos Mencia is there. David Nastor, he was always a very much, he did a lot of radio. I did a little bit of radio there. So, Carlos Mencia's white hot microphone, he's just so challenging and controversial and funny. And they recognize me in the audience. So, they challenged me to take a joke, so tell a joke. So, my brain goes empty, but I do remember one joke. So, I go with it. I go, Okay, so there's a Scottish uh, guy in Scotland. He's American. He just wants to go to a real Scottish bar. And he comes in, it's dark, and there's only a bartender and one weird-looking guy at the far end of the bar. And um, he's about to order something, and suddenly a big mug of beer comes down, splashes into his arm, and uh, the weird-looking guy goes, Hey, laddie, my name's McGregor. Can I buy you a beer? And he comes over, and he's just ugly pockmark skin matted hair bad breath body or uh, just disgusting and he goes let me ask you something laddie do you like the stool you're sitting on and he goes 
I just got here, but yeah, that's fine. He goes, oh, I built this stool painstaking like by me by myself. Most of the stools in here and and, and the stools in Scotland, but do you think they call me McGregor, the stool maker? He goes, and laddie, do you like the tables in here? He goes, I just told you I just got here, but yeah, they're nice. He goes, oh, oh I built these tables painstaking like by myself with me own hands me own fucking hand look at the craftsmanship look at the design everything perfect like but you think they call me mcgregor the table maker no he goes well i'm sorry he goes one last thing laddie he goes what he goes do you like do you like the the bar you're leaning against he goes yeah it's nice he goes <laughs> I built this bar painstaking like by myself with me own me own fucking hands. The look at the brass, the, the wood, the grain, the everything perfect. I built every detail, most of the finest bars in all of fucking Scotland. But do you think they call me McGregor the bar builder? But laddie, you suck just one cock. <laughs> just one cock. <laughs> Uh. Okay. So my cousin, my my cousin heard that joke the night before, and he's drunk out of his mind, and we're in a mafia club That's out in New good. York, and the no. guy's going, "Hey, I built no this. such thing I, as the mafia, John. I just want to. I built clear. this. I built that. <laughs> I built this. And my cousin says to the mafia guy, "Yeah, one night you carried away, you suck one dick. Do they remember you as Vinny, the club builder?" No, you're always going to be Vinny the cocksucker. And the guy goes, hey, what's the matter with this guy? What, does he want to die? Like, shut up. No, we're, we're, we're you up against the time wall. you got to know your crowd. We're up, against, we're up against the time wall here, guys. But I want to say one thing, Nick. Uh, I, I'd never met you before. I've known about you. But you know what? After listening to you, I want to be like you, Nick, when I grow up. I really do. That, you're awesome, man. Well, you know yeah. what, Craig, you know, this is the other thing that's really true is whatever you see in me, it's in you, buddy. Well, I, I mean, I, 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 I thank you. I, I hope so. I, I, I would really like to, you know, like I said, you, you touch on a lot of issues, which I feel very strongly about. Well, thank and I'm you. sure you'll be yeah. hearing. For, I'm sure you'll be hearing for David Nastar because he has a podcast. Too. <laughs> the yeah. funny thing oh, is, okay. is I, the funny thing is, is I thought uh, I told John and then Craig before the show, because like I said, I've never been a big football guy. I said, I said, I'm probably going to sit this show out and just listen to you guys. I thought it was just going to be a big football interview, but it turned out to be. And what did an I tell you? Show. I told you it's going to be more about football, right? Yeah. More, yeah, more you about, know, than football. Uh, yeah. well, he really is not into football. He asked me how many home runs you hit, so he he doesn't know. <laughs> I'm not that <laughs> I'm far. I'm not that New York. Either. I'm going to New York uh, a week from tomorrow. And, you know, the Jets opening game is 9-11. My best friend is Jim Kreinler is the 9-11 family's attorney. Oh. So we'll be at that game. And, of course, Aaron Rodgers wearing my number eight. I That's know. Right. That bastard. You want me Church to talk to him? Bastard. You want me to have a little talk with him? Or yeah, Mike could talk to him. Make him off or he can't refuse. Yeah. How you, doing? you know, Come I here. mean, they got they got, they, they, they got Browning Nagel's number. Why can't he get that one? That's what I want to know. Because that may be jinxed. <laughs> Chad Pennington, then whoever you know, hey, the Jets going to be good this year. They'll win at least ten games, and and they might they might take off. We'll see. I hope so. I hope so. Aaron Rodgers, man, look, I've been watching that uh, Hard Knocks. Hard Knocks. He's a character, man. He's and I cool. a lot of that's so stale. And a man. hell of a Jeopardy host. He's a he cool. Is, dude. He's a cool he dude. is a cool like dude, man. Yes, he, he oh. is a cool dude. Well, thank you. Well, so hey, I guess we got to get out of here, right? Yeah. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Thank you, guys. The thank you, Nick. Thank, thank you so much. And let's stay in touch. Don't let's make it another 15 years, all right? No, let's do it. Mike, John, Craig, you guys are yeah. awesome. Thank yeah. you. And if you, ever need, you, if you ever need comedians, you got my number. Let me know. We'll always okay. help you. And, and, yeah, John, John knows yeah. guys he can call for you. And now we have to go to the trivia exactly. question. <laughs> and Nick, we have a thing where I ask a trivia question at the end of every episode. So okay. I have a new one today. But the answer to last week's, you know, when we had when we had Tommy Chong on, I said, what what kind of business did did Tommy Chong's character Leo own on that 70s show? He owned a photomat. Ah, yeah, no, no, nobody has, we need you guys to send your answers to the big bad broadcast like anyone would know what a photo mat is we'll, we'll get you something you will get you autographs we'll get you some bubble gum we'll some get flash you some flash cubes flash cubes whatever you want now today autograph, an, autograph, an autograph uh, oysters, poster, you get some oysters did you say oysters 
No. Okay. No. Okay. So today's question, uh, today's question is actually a uh, uh, kind of good one. Um, wait, wait. Lift up your hat. I think you have the imprint from the thing on your head. Oh, not your hair. All right. <laughs> it looked like it looked yes. like. Your hair it's looks a little just, greasy. What do you do? Comb it with a pork chop, Craig? It, it looked like <laughs> I never, I never shower in the morning. It looked like I thought the Jets thing came off on his uh, head. He's no, trying to end. All right, uh, he's that's trying to end. That so that's today, that. today's question. Please remember: go to the Big Bad Broadcast at gmail dot com with your answer. It is back in nineteen sixty five. Jerry uh, Jerry Van Dyke took the role in the very very bad Jerry who Van Dyke. Van Dyke. Okay. Jerry Van Dyke took a role in the lead of one of the worst sitcoms of all time called My Mother the Car. That's not the question. The question is, what role did he turn down to take that? My sister, the octopus. That was correct. Oh. Nice one. You nailed that right <laughs> off the top, man. Very nice. Yeah, Jerry dude. Van Dyke, not to be confused with yes. Jerry Van Butch. Jerry Van was it, Dyke. In 1965, was it Mitch McConnell, like 70? Yes, and he was still stuttering. Yes. Ian Strom Thurmond and, and then the wonderful senator from Diane Feinstein, who used to be a, a wonderful uh, you know, individual, but she's not doing too well. Do you hear that her daughter now has a power of attorney over and she's still a senator? Old. Which is weird. She's 146 years old. He's not that old. No. <laughs> but no, but the hey, man. Is, I just saw that on the news. Anyway, we're, we're over. Da, 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 All right. Da, da, da. So, hey, this is John Fernantino here at the Big Bad Broadcast. We'd like to thank our guest, Nick Lowry. Thank yeah. you, Give him a round of applause. He's a real inspiration to all of you. And Absolutely. we got Craig Mitchell Hello, and goodbye. Mike Grief. And this thank is the you. Big Bad Broadcast. And you can find us anywhere your podcast. You get your podcast. Yes, podcast Apple Podcast Playground, Apple Podcast. There's too many Spotify. to mention. But well, we are every place and keep us going, man. Peace. Right. See you next week. Shaq Proud. Yes. Bye, bye, Nick. Bye. Thanks again.